please discuss the background for this study. Well, we're part of the North American Wisconsin Quality of Life Stone uh, Research Consortium. And what this is looking at is using the WISQUAL Life Questionnaire, which is a stone-specific health-related quality of life questionnaire. And one of the things we wanted to look at was we know that, you know, in the past, we've always looked at stones as its own sort of event, its own disease. We now realize and recognize that the stones are actually part of a larger syndrome. In fact, <clears throat> it's greatly equated with diabetes, high blood pressure, and hyperlipidemia. So before we used to just think, oh, it's a kidney stone, but now I think we're taking a bit of a more holistic approach. And you know, inside of this very large North American consortium, which where we have over 3,000 patients, we decided to look at our patients with and without metabolic syndrome and look at their health-related quality of life. So we had about 3,000 patients who, who actually uh, met this criteria. And then we wanted to look and see, you know, what were the differences if you had metabolic syndrome and if you didn't, and how was your health related quality of life in regards to the stone disease? And that's, that's how, that's our methodology. What were some of the notable findings and were any of them surprising to you and your co-authors? Um, good question. So some of them were a little bit uh, not surprising in terms of the fact that we do know that metabolic syndrome, so having a kidney stone is essentially an extension of having high blood pressure and diabetes. So if you have those things, you are more likely to get a kidney stone. Now we didn't study that because these are all people who already have kidney stones. What we can tell you is that the patients with metabolic syndrome actually had a worse quality of life than patients who did not. So again, not surprising. You know, you, we know that you've got uh, diabetes, we know that you've got hypertension and we know that you're obese and also that you have um, problems with your lipids. So if you have uh, any, at least three of those, you're certainly going to have a higher risk of getting stones. And if you have even all of them, your, your risk actually go up from threefold up to sixfold. So certainly the more of those you have, the, the, the more instance of stones you have. So that was not surprising. And one of the neat things was that if you had a, um, the, the one thing that was also indicative was obesity. Those who were obese and high, had a higher BMI actually had a lower health related quality of life. And that just goes without uh, saying. So if you're heavier, your BMI is greater than 30, you're at a way higher risk of having the high lipids, diabetes and hypertension already. So I think just looking at that one factor, if we were just to help our patients with one thing, it would probably be to lose weight because losing weight just really has a trickle down effect on your blood pressure, on your glucose intolerance and your lipids as well too. Then the second thing we found that was significant was that patients with diabetes also had a significantly lower health related quality of life compared to those who did not have diabetes. And if you had hyper, uh, hyperlipidemia or just hypertension, those actually remain the same. So the two things really are weight and diabetes, which really do go hand in hand. And of course you could say the hyperlipidemia and hypertension, but in our study, we actually didn't find that. So that, that's something that was a little bit um, uh, interesting and a little bit surprising. The other thing that I could say is that we actually looked at patients who now have uh, stones in the past versus stones now. And if you currently have stones, your health-related quality of life is actually worse than if you had stones in the past. And if you did have it in the past, whether or not you had metabolic syndrome or non-metabolic syndrome, it didn't affect your health-related quality of life with the WISQUAL questionnaire. I should say that that's actually a very specific thing because the WISQUAL is only looking at your quality of life with respect to stone disease, which is why it's a very sensitive marker. I think if we were to look at those patients between uh, the, the old previous stone formers with and without stones um, from previous, I think we probably would find a difference in their quality of life overall, because when you have diabetes and hypertension and you're obese, certainly your quality of life is typically a lot lower. But those, those are the main uh, findings that we had. Uh, what makes this, um, this type of research um, significant? I think the big thing is that we've always treated stone disease as its own sort of separate entity. And, and then now I think that we are looking at it more holistically. Before we would have specific stone diets. So 
you would have a diet for hypertension, a diet for diabetes, and then a diet for kidney stones. And I think what the evidence is showing now, so Christina Penniston, who was one of the founders of the Wisqual uh, Research Consortium, is, is a PhD in dietitian. And I think what she would say to you and say to patients is that we shouldn't be counseling for a very stone-specific diet. We really should be counseling for a healthier diet. So things that will help you prevent from getting high blood pressure or from lowering your glucose intolerance will actually help with preventing kidney stones too. Things like the diet, DASH diet, the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension, have been shown in uh, evidence by Gary Curhan to show that essentially that really will decrease your risk, not only of your high blood pressure, but also of kidney stones as well too. So this means uh, a normal amount of water, but it also doesn't mean restricting calcium, a normal calcium intake of between 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. And rather than restricting oxalate, which is what we used to do for patients, so no green leafy vegetables at all, uh, a lot of plant products would be gone. So instead of restricting those like we did before, we now recommend a good healthy amount spinach, kale, all these green leafy vegetables are actually good for you. And as long as you get enough calcium in your diet to actually bind that oxalate while it's in your gut, that'll form a crystal that you will then excrete in the stool rather than just absorbing the oxalate where it will go to your kidney and form a kidney stone. So I would say that the, the major thing that I think this has um, been to me and I think a lot of our authors is that this really looks at kidney stones in a big holistic way that we should be counseling and treating people for just a healthier lifestyle and a healthier diet to help prevent all of these things. It's not just kidney stones, but it's high blood pressure, it's your lipids, it's your obesity and your diabetes as well too. What sort of uh, prevention strategies can be utilized for patients with metabolic syndrome uh, besides you know, what you've already mentioned uh, in terms of diet, you know, I, whether they be you know, stone specific prevention or just, um, you know, any other lifestyle, um, you know, modification or, um, you know, recommendations. Yeah. And I think the major thing for this that I really like is the fact that we are just counseling for a healthier lifestyle, healthier diet. You know, you don't have to avoid certain things. People were um, avoiding spinach like they were allergic to it. They couldn't eat kale. There's no chocolate, no coffee, because um, th those are all things that may be high in oxalate. And those are not true. I think you need to keep up with that. So I think this has been a major impact. Um, the calcium story was answered a long time ago, again, with Kerhan studies, but and also with um, uh, other studies from the New England Journal of Medicine, but the, the Borgi study. But what that d doesn't... Uh, um, Basically, you should have normal amounts of calcium. People were restricting calcium before, but we now realize that was exactly the wrong thing to do. So I think that the way this has helped with prevention is it's just made it a little bit easier. And I think it's made it a little bit easier for patients too. I often get a lot of patients who go on the internet, look up stone disease diets, and they've come in and they've restricted all these things and made their life very, very difficult because they, there's these always sort of kind of pinpoint things. And I think if we were just able to give them a more general thing about how to basically lower their blood pressure, lower their diabetes, I think it'll be so much easier for them. So in addition to that, you know, I think recommendations, and this makes the dietitian's life a lot easier, it makes the nephrologist's life a lot easier, and the urologist too. So in addition to this, I still think that routine imaging, depending on when their last incidence was, is a good thing to do so that we can capture stones and see them when they're at a smaller stage so that we're more likely or able to treat them before they get too large and have to convert to more invasive procedures. So I think monitoring with your healthcare team is still very important and there's a lot of people involved in that team. Do you and your co-authors plan to conduct further research on this topic and if so what will the focus be? Yeah, that, 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 so essentially you know we have over 3,000 patients in this uh, study and we're continuing to look at them. So we've published on several different things on um, you know, where do you live and your uh, access to medical care. Does that affect your health-related quality of life? And one of the um, reviewers, who, uh, Dr. Mantu Gupta, who, who is going to write a uh, editorial comment on our article for the Journal of Endurology, was asking us, 
Is this a specific issue with the metabolic syndrome, or is it also related to the fact that there are different stone types in there? And some of the stone types, such as cysteine or struvite, will actually recur more quickly. And is that part of the problem? Um, so one of the things we're going to look at, because we didn't look at it in this study, is to look at health-related quality of life depending on your stone type and your stone analysis, as well as how quickly they recur. And of course, we're also looking at uh, right now, we're, we're talking about leaving how we can leave asymptomatic stones alone that are non-obstructing. But I think what we haven't looked at is that our CT scanner now is just so uh, high resolution that our bar of being stone free has become that much higher. With just getting an x-ray and an ultrasound being stone free, you know, we recognize that we weren't catching all the stones, but now with CT, even if you have a tiny little fleck or something, um, and it may not even be a kidney stone or maybe a papillary tip calcification or a parenchymal calcification, what we're finding with that is that those patients aren't considered stone free. And with that, essentially, that may um, cause a problem and we may be pushed to do more surgery in order to get those patients stone free. But part of our other um, research is actually to look at, you know, what if we leave some of these small stones alone? What is their quality of life uh, in terms of just their everyday quality of life? What's that like compared to getting two or three operations versus just the one that they have some fragments left behind? Now, we know that if you leave a fragment behind, sometimes some of those pieces can then pass out, cause some problems. You have to go to emergency. But that rate, we think, might be low. The literature suggests it's about 19% per year, although we don't have great evidence with that. And if we were to leave them alone, what would happen? Would, would the quality of life, and our, our hypothesis is that the quality of life would actually be lower if you undergo multiple, multiple surgeries to get that CT stone free versus just watching someone and treating them if that stone gets bigger or if it becomes symptomatic. And I think this will be a, a big help to help you all to say, you know, just to sort of say, it's okay, leave that little piece alone. The study shows that the health related quality of life is actually better with just watching these pieces. Now, of course, that's, it'll be on a case by case basis, obviously, if you're an airline pilot or in the military, all these kind of things. However, you know, I think we just need to help guide our urologists and guide our physicians on how to follow up on these patients with uh, asymptomatic residual fragments. What is the take home message for the practicing urologist? I think the take home message here is that kidney stones are not its own entity. It needs to be treated as part of a larger overall patient syndrome, and that's the metabolic syndrome. We now have great evidence to show that it is related to the obesity, the hypertension, the diabetes, and the hyperlipidemia. I think it's funny that uh, back in the dark ages, people were dying because of starvation. They were dying because we didn't have enough food, but now we're actually dying from literally eating too much. Because there is such an obesity epidemic um, in most developed parts of the world that the commonest causes of kidney failure right now are diabetes and hypertension. So, and with that as an extension is kidney stone disease. So what I would like to suggest is that when erectile dysfunction came out um, and came more into light when we had uh, sildenafil come out, I, we recognized then that those vessels to the penis were much smaller than the coronary vessels. So that if you were to diagnose erectile dysfunction in someone who didn't have coronary artery disease, their risk of getting coronary artery disease was really, really quite high. The same manner, a kidney stone can be a sentinel event and can actually trigger what uh, patients might get later on. So whenever I see a young person, a man or a woman, uh, earlier on in their life, in their 20s or 30s, and they, they're otherwise healthy but develop a kidney stone, I tell them they are a much higher risk for getting a, uh, for diabetes, hypertension, as well as coronary artery disease and a myocardial infarction. That's been shown as well too, that patients with those kidney stone uh, actually have a higher risk of getting those other things. And that goes along because when you get a kidney stone, you're at higher risk for metabolic syndrome, which of course places you at higher risk for myocardial infarction and uh, coronary artery disease. So I guess my, my bottom line would be treat the patient as a whole, not just as a stone former. We need to kind of uh, help them get a hold of their lifestyle and their health overall.